it's, um, it's very nice to be back here at JAX. This is a wonderful conference, and I enjoy coming back every several years. I hope you'll continue to have me come back every several years. Do you actually remember the time when you wrote your first line of code? It's like, you know, this magical time. So as a new technology comes along, I like to play with it. And so a lot of things I'm talking about today may not be appropriate for your organization now. But I suspect in the next four or five years, a lot of the things will be pretty standard for you.
Jetzt aber einen recht schönen guten Morgen wünsche ich. Tag Nummer drei dieser riesengroßen Konferenz. Ich, hab, ich hoffe, ihr habt noch genügend Kraft und Energie in den Knochen und vor allem in den Gehirnen, ja, um aufmerksam zu sein. Ja, ich freue mich, ähm, dass es weitergeht, dass wir schon wieder so viele äh, Highlights anzukündigen haben. Ähm, bevor wir gleich in die Keynote reingehen, möchte ich auch noch mal auf unser heutiges äh, Lab hinweisen. Heute Nachmittag um 15 Uhr äh, macht Henning Schwendner ein Open Lab zum Thema Event Storming. Das heißt, wenn Sie sich da interessieren für, äh, für Event Storming, sind Sie wie gesagt herzlich ein, zu, eingeladen, sich, äh, wie ich gestern schon sagte, zum Thema Labs vorne an der Speaker-Registrierung ähm, ähm, einzutragen. Die Teilnehmerzahl ist auf ca. 20 limitiert, damit es insgesamt funktioniert. Jedenfalls eine spannende Sache, falls Sie schon wahnsinnig viele Vorträge gehört haben und zwischendurch mal die Ärmel hochkrempeln wollen und was machen selber, sind Sie herzlich eingeladen, sich mit Event Storming bei Henning Schwendner zu beschäftigen. Nochmal darauf hinweisen möchte ich, gerade weil es heute der letzte Tag der Hauptkonferenz ist, ähm, dass wir weiterhin natürlich sehr, sehr dankbar sind und ähm, scharf darauf sind, wenn Sie bitte alle Sessions, Vorträge, alles, was Sie hier erleben, äh, bewerten. Sie wissen, Feedback ist wahnsinnig wichtig, auch für Konferenzanbieter, nicht nur für Softwareentwickler. Ähm, geben Sie uns Ihr Feedback, geben Sie vor allem auch den Speakern Ihr Feedback. Ähm, wir leiten das direkt eben auch an die Speaker weiter. Ähm, Sie können sicher sein, jeder wirklich arbeitet hart daran und versucht auch die, die Rückmeldungen ernst zu nehmen, äh, um sich auch zu verbessern, wenn es Verbesserungsbedarf gibt. Und den gibt es bekanntlich natürlich immer. Now I'm switching to English. Um, as it's about announcing our next keynote, the very first keynote of this day. Uh, it is again about open source. Um, and I just had a short conversation with our keynote speaker, uh, remembering that this conference uh, uh, many, many years ago started, who knows what the It used to be an acronym, JAX. Who knows what the original acronym was about of JAX? Does anybody know or remember this? Yes, yes. And I remember those times when lots of sponsors and companies said, why the hell are you getting so deep into open source? We don't like this. Yeah? These were different times. Uh, so at that time we said, okay, this is, was about Java, Apache, XML. The idea was really, okay, uh, making understandable that even at that time, we're speaking about 2001, uh, open source was one of the key drivers for innovation, for technical innovation. And we are really proud of that now, okay, this thing, open source, is kind of mainstream, but it's still a lot to learn about the mechanisms of open source, the, the value chain of open source, and of course, uh, um, the, the idea companies and, and large organizations collaborating and co-working together on open source projects. Our keynote speaker is a veteran in the IT industry uh, and his biography is really deeply attached to the idea of the open and open source. He used to work for Sun Microsystems in the earlier times and now is CTO of Open Technologies at IBM. Please welcome Christopher Ferris. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. <clears throat> All right. Morning. Uh, if you're expecting me to give this in German, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's not in one of my skill sets. Um, but I'm Chris Ferris. I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for Open Tech. I basically have overall responsibility for all of the open source and open standards work that we do at IBM. I help to set the strategy and And, um, and I also help to sort of manage both the sort of the consumption of open source as well as the uh, contribution to open source from an IBM perspective. So I, I think it's, it's probably safe to say that open source won the battle of how software is developed. Um, it's, you know, it's been a bit of a a balancing act between what's proprietary and what's open. I think there's still a certain amount of um, work to be done to get software companies like IBM and Google and so forth to fully embrace the fact that all of this open source, all of the source code should be open. The entire product should be open. But that'll come, that'll come. The, the recent announcement of 
IBM acquiring Red Hat for 34 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars, I think really sort of hammers home the fact that, yep, open source won. Red Hat is sort of the pure open source play that I think in the early days, everybody was scoffing, saying, well, it can't be done. You can't make money with open source. I spend my entire, or not in my entire time, but I spend a good amount of my time trying to convince people that, yes, you could make money with open source, right? You don't have to have differentiating features. You have to deliver software. You have to package it up. You have to support it and sustain it and integrate it with other things, but you don't have to make it unique to your own brand. So th I think the transition that's happened over the past couple of years, especially, has been that not only are the major vendors and so forth contributing to open source, but consumers of technology are starting to contribute to open source. So enterprise companies, whether it's manufacturing or banking or insurance, are starting to contribute to open source. In fact, it's pushing to about 50% of companies are actively encouraging their developers to contribute to open source. And they want to do this, and it's not just the altruistic aspects of things, but they recognize that the skill sets that people need in technology today are being, they're, they're being developed through participation in open source. And the, skills, the skilled engineers that they're looking for are working together side by side with the engineers that they put out and have working out in the open source communities. And that's a good way of hiring people. So, so open source won, but let's consider that the, the breadth of types of open source projects that there are. <clears throat> so I have this, this graphic here furniture left by the side of the road. I don't know if they have that in Germany, but this is a good metaphor for the United States because people often put their sofa out on the side of the, and they put, take me, right? And so it's free, you can have it. And you can have all the coins that are in the, 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 the sofa, right? Those are yours too, right? Uh, and all the bugs and all the crumbs left from people sitting there eating potato chips while they're watching TV, that's all yours, right? And there's an awful lot of open source out on GitHub, for instance, that's exactly that. It's just the equivalent of furniture left by the side of the road. Anybody can pick it up, it's yours, it's free, but it's your responsibility now, right? And, um, and that's great, but it doesn't really help you if that was a reclining sofa and the mechanism to recline the chair is broken, well, you have to fix it the person who left it by the side of the road isn't gonna fix it for you, right? So when you're consuming open source, you have to consider the fact of the risk that whoever put it there in the first place may or may not be willing to support it, right? Um, and, uh, and so that, that can be a problem. So there's an awful lot of that. In fact, I think the vast majority of open source out on GitHub is of this nature, right? And, and that's okay. It's fine, it's, it's a good thing somebody is putting, I've solved a problem, I put it out there, I'm sharing that with other people. And if they want to take it, they can have it. And that's a good thing. I don't, I don't, want, I don't make the case that it's not a good thing, but my point is, when you pick up open source that's got a license like MIT or something like that, he says, here it is, it's yours, it's as is. I'm not gonna help you. There's probably a likelihood that nobody's gonna sub, uh, to, to, to merge pull requests that get submitted against that. It's just, it's free software. The next kind of open source that we find is sort of either vendor or individual controlled software um, that's published. So, you know, examples of this are like TensorFlow from Google. Um, Redis, people familiar with Redis? Redis is a in-memory database. It's basically maintained by a single individual, right? And, and we call this, sometimes we call this the benevolent dictator model of open source, 
where somebody is basically controlling what's going on, they're the architect, they're the one that's reviewing and vetting all of the contributions that may or may not come in, and they're exerting tight control over the architecture, over the feature set, and so forth, the release cadence, is all controlled by either a single vendor or a single individual. Again, this can be a good thing, right? So you have Linux. Linux is the sort of the, the classic example of a benevolent dictator with Linus Torvalds. And Linus has been, uh, he's been knocked down a peg <laughs> lately. Um, but, uh, but basically, but he's done a really effective job of making sure that we have some architectural coherence, that the quality of the software that gets merged into the Linux kernel is of the highest quality, and he's cultivating a set of lieutenants at the Linux Foundation uh, in the Linux kernel project to make sure that there's some sustainability associated with that. And, and that gets to my, to my next point. And my next point is basically that, but with a single point of control, with a single vendor, with a single individual controlling a project, there's risk, right? So we talked about the risk attendant with, I'm just picking up some software and it's, it's mine. If there's a vulnerability in there, like in OpenSSL with Heartbleed, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, you know, is there gonna be somebody there to fix it? No, but there's the other form of risk, which is, let's say I have a vendor-led software project in open source, and the vendor decides, you know, from a budget perspective, or their business isn't going all that well, and they say, you know what, we're not gonna do this anymore. And this has happened, right? It's unfortunate, but it does happen, right? Um, so an example of this was Facebook with Parse. People familiar with Parse? Parse was a, um, a popular sort of developer platform for mobile. And um, Facebook decided one day, we're not doing this anymore. And so they just stopped contributing to it. And they didn't unopen source it or anything, but they basically now left everybody, and it was a very popular platform. But Facebook wasn't going to fund development of it. <clears throat> and now the community is sort of adrift. How are we going to, to manage this? And basically what happened, though, is that people that were using Parse then went and found something else. So Parse is now basically dead. Right? I mean, it's still around, but it's not really the thing that it once was. And that's because the vendor just decided, you know what, I'm sorry, we're just not going to do this anymore. It's not in our, it's not in our financial interest to do so. Um, uh, there are other examples. Actually, one was undone recently, but you know, we, Apple acquired the company that was building fin, uh, Foundation DB, and they unopen sourced it, essentially. Now, again, the source code is still out there, but they're not maintaining it externally in open source anymore. They were, they were bringing it inter internally. They, they eventually reversed that after a couple, three years. But again, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you have single vendor control or single individual control, there's that risk that the individual, if Sebastian, the guy who's the maintainer for Redis, gets hit by a bus, <laughs> somebody, he's the only one that understands that code base, right? There's not a whole lot of people that contribute to Redis. It's a very small set of individuals, and he's the one that knows everything about it. So if he gets hit by a bus, unfortunately, gets struck by lightning or what have you, it's a very unfortunate, but it's also very unfortunate for everybody that's starting to take on a critical strategic dependency of the Redis platform, the Redis database. So the risk is something that I think we have to bear in mind when we think about just putting out something as open source that's controlled by a single vendor, because again, vendors are gonna operate in their best interest. They're not necessarily gonna be operating in the interest of the broader community. So at IBM, we think there's a better way. We think there's a better approach to how do you build software in the open? How do you build open source software? And we call this open governance. And the the critical distinctions are, first of all, we, we, we pull together a community. It's not just single vendor, we have multi-vendor communities. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. But we have multiple con you know, participants that are sponsoring and supporting the endeavor, right? Responsible licensing, so we choose a license that fits the needs of that particular community. 
Now again, it could be GPL, but it's more likely to be Apache or Eclipse or, or one of the more uh, permissive licenses. An acceptable and accessible commit process, right? Where we've published contributor guidelines, where we have uh, a, you know, a, a code of conduct, where we have an approach that basically invites people to come and contribute and tells them, here's the path to becoming a committer or a maintainer, as they're called sometimes. <clears throat> Creating a diverse ecosystem. We want to create projects that have multiple providers of that technology. If there's only a single vendor that's providing an offering, you know, a, a production grade offering to enterprises for a particular open source project, it's not really open source. It's proprietary software being developed with an open source license that says you can take this if you'd like. But we like to have communities that actually establish a diverse ecosystem that essentially are establishing that code base as a de facto standard. And in fact, a function of what we're trying to achieve here is to sort of take the traditional developing of open standards by a bunch of guys and gals going to diverse locations all over the globe, sitting around a table, writing a specification that they then hand down to the engineering department and say, please build me one of these. And then each of the, uh, each of the vendors goes off and builds a piece of software, and lo and behold, they don't interoperate because people interpreted the text, the prose of the specification differently. So we think open source is a better way of doing that, and we'd like to be able to create this sort of diverse community, this diverse ecosystem of offerings. We like this notion of a participative meritocracy. And I know in open source, a lot of people, they don't like the term meritocracy. And I, I think that the arguments around that are, are valid, but the reality is that you do want to basically encourage people to sort of earn their stripes in those communities and, and earn the rights of being able to sort of become a committers and so forth. And we do that by participating. And again, there's many ways that you can participate. And we call this collectively, we call it open governance. And historically, this has been the most successful approach to open source. In fact, um, there, is, there, is, there, there have been studies done that have demonstrated that Projects that are developed under open governance, whether it's Apache, Eclipse, Linux, Mozilla, are orders of magnitude more successful than those that are not. Now again, it's not black or white, but for the most part, those projects that have multiple stakeholders, multiple sponsors, multiple, a diverse community of contributors, those are the ones that tend to be the most successful, have the the longest sustainability in the marketplace. And then you have to ask, well, why is that? Well, it's because of that. It's because of all of those things that they, they, t they tend to be very successful. Now, <clears throat> you know, so there's, there's an awful lot of, so Apache, Apache was started, and again, this was interested in Sebastian telling me the, the history of how the, the JAX conference, the JAX brand came into being it's Java, Apache, and XML, and I'm thinking back, and well, that's my heritage, right? I was at Sun Microsystems, and I did Java. I started working with John Bosack and some of the other people that invented XML, and I was working on XML, and then web services, and SOAP. But Apache was started back in the day as a place where we would provide an open governance framework to develop the Apache HTTP server, just one project. Today, there's over 300 projects at the Apache Software Foundation, and many of them have nothing to do with HTTP or the web. You know, we've got data analytics, Spark, you've got Cassandra, you've got Kafka, you've got all kinds of technologies being developed at the Apache Software Foundation today. A lot of them reach back to my own, uh, my own early days with the work that IBM contributed um, to the Apache Software Foundation around Xerces and Xalan and a lot of the web services stuff that I did. Um, why is that? How, how did that happen? How do we go from just HTTP to more than 300 different projects? The, the, the reason that that happened is because there's a governance structure that encourages this diverse participative approach to developing 
these open source projects, and they nurture them, they cultivate them, and they encourage, in order to get past incubation, you need to establish a diverse community of contributions into that project. And so as a motivating factor, and then the governance structure itself allows that to happen. It creates what we, I like to call a safe place to innovate. Eclipse, a very similar situation happened. IBM created Eclipse, as I think many of you probably know, um, by contributing into it the initial Eclipse framework, the Java-based IDE. Um, so we created a foundation, give it an open governance structure that was similar but a little bit different than Apache. And actually, it turns out that IBM was actually key in, in helping to establish that framework, that governance structure, the legal framework, the licensing for both Eclipse and Apache. Um, <clears throat> And um, so now we have at Eclipse, we're, we're approaching 400 projects at Eclipse now, right? And many of them have nothing to do with IDEs or even Java, right? There's projects that have nothing to do with Java going on at Eclipse. Well, why is that? It's because we created a safe place to innovate, a place where even the Oracles and the IBMs and the Sun Microsystems of the day could come, and despite the fact that they're fierce competitors, they could collaborate together in the open to collaboratively develop technologies related to Java and XML and various other technologies. Same thing with the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation was initially established with the function of providing a governance structure, multiple stakeholders to fund the development of the Linux kernel to basically pay Linus Torvalds a salary, but also to ensure that he's cultivating a set of lieutenants that when he decides that he's going to retire, and that's going to come eventually, there's a tier of engineers that can step in and provide similar levels of, uh, of, of architectural guidance and so forth for the project as it goes forward. And you know, so the Linux kernel has been probably the most successful open source project ever. And it's because we put that governance structure around it. It's because we have multiple vendors contributing to that, that it's that successful. Um, and again, the Linux Foundation also said, well, we've got this structure. It's working pretty well for Linux. Let's open that up. Let's get others to contribute to it as well. And so now there's uh, approaching 60 projects within the Linux Foundation, what they call collaborative projects, uh, some of which we're working on. So, so who is paying, right? So the, the, the important thing to understand is that while we've created these safe place to innovate, it costs money, right? You, you know, it costs money for these organizations to exist, for them to have the marketing resources, for them to have the, the you know, paying for the infrastructure to run the continuous integration and delivery of the various projects, uh, to run the issue tracking and the web uh, site and uh, potentially to have like a test environment that people can come and they can use to kick the tires for the various projects that all costs money, right? And so we've created these the sort of foundation structure for doing open source that ensures that we're providing that sustainable infrastructure around these things to make them real. <clears throat> so you know, at Apache, they've got different levels of sponsorship. Same thing with. Eclipse and with the Linux Foundation, and there are others, there's OpenStack and Cloud Foundry, and there's tons of these things out there. I'm just using these as examples. Um, but the important thing is the diversity of the sponsorship. Again, it's corporate sponsorship. So there's an awful lot of open source, as I mentioned, going back, that's just an individual writing some code and putting it out there, and maybe even, you know, it's a, it's a an act of love and, uh, you know, to, to nurture and cultivate some piece of software out in the open and have people use it, that's, that's, real, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good motivator. But the problem is, again, that we have software out there that people are starting to integrate, and if something bad happens, all of a sudden, this has a viral effect. I, if you remember, there was a, um, a, an issue in Node community a while back where an individual got really upset with NPM, the, the, uh, the registry repository for all of the node modules that a lot of people use, and he decided to pull 11 lines of code. 11 lines of code. 
Turns out 11 lines of code were used in millions of projects. And all of a sudden, every one of those projects stopped working. And everybody freaked out because you can't just do that. You can't just take you know, your thing out and, and make it not available. It's, people are depending on that, right? Same sort of thing happened with OpenSSL. OpenSSL suffered from the heart bleed vulnerability. Well, there were two engineers that were working on OpenSSL in their spare time. They both got real jobs, right, after they finished developing it. And they were only putting in sort of best effort to go in and, and submit patches and merge pull requests and so forth. And, uh, and then we had Heartbleed. And we had to sort of, you know, where are these guys, right? Who's going to fix OpenSSL? Because this is really bad. This is important. We have to make sure that it's, it's fixed. So the Linux Foundation created a project called the Core Infrastructure Initiative. And again, this is, we need to be able to sort of fund development around some of these critical infrastructures, especially from a security perspective type projects, to ensure that we have somebody that's doing continuous integration delivery testing of the thing that is funding development around it to ensure that somebody is going to fix the next Heartbleed vulnerability that comes along in OpenSSL. And it's not just OpenSSL. There's a number of different projects that are being worked on there. But the important point here is that we're funding essentially a community around that critical infrastructure software. <clears throat> So IBM, you know, we have a long history in doing open source throughout the years. Um, you know, it starts back, in fact, IBM in many cases is sort of, is somewhat responsible for the, for the legitimacy, if you will, of using open source in the enterprise, right? We, 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 we indemnified clients that were using Linux back in the very earliest days against the set of suits that were, going, that were ongoing around Linux um, that were essentially initiated by a fierce competitor in the northwest corner of the United States. Um, some of, and now, they're very good open source people now, so we're not going to bash them too much. But um, uh, that was a problem back then, right? They were trying to defend their operating system, and Linux was perceived as a threat. And so they were trying to use legal means to uh, to, uh, to attack that, and in fact, one of the ways that they chose was to say, okay, if you, consumer, if you enterprise user, are using this, you're violating some of our patents, you owe us money, right? Not just the vendor that sold you this software. And that was a problem, so IB IBM said, well, you know what? We got you covered. Client, if you want to use Linux, go ahead. And if somebody sues you, we'll pay, right? And that sort of unleashed and, and legitimize the use of Linux in the enterprise. And that sort of fueled the whole motion. It, it, open source had existed before then, but it wasn't really legitimate in the enterprise. And now, all of a sudden, it was. And that was an important step. And we helped to establish the Linux Foundation as well um, when that time came. We established, with others, the Apache Software Foundation. As I mentioned, we actually wrote the license and the governance structure for Apache initially. Um, and we provided a set of engineers that went to, went to work around the, uh, the Apache HTTP server and have been contributing there ever since. I mean, in fact, we've had somebody in the leadership um, in the Apache Software Foundation pretty much ever since the initial days as well. And we still have the, the president of the Apache Software Foundation and Sam Ruby. Um, again, I mentioned Linux and... and Again, similar kind of a situation where we recognize we need to, we need to make sure that Linus <laughs> doesn't decide he doesn't want to do this anymore. This is too important. We need to build a foundation around this, and we also need to ensure that somebody is his boss, collectively, the community of stakeholders around the Linux platform, to make sure that not only is he paid, but that he also cultivates some lieutenants underneath them to make sure that we have somebody, we have sustainability going forward from this uh, benevolent dictator type approach. Eclipse, I mentioned, same sort of thing. IBM created the Eclipse Foundation. We seeded it with uh, a whole lot of code around the initial Java IDE framework. And that is, again, blossomed. Same sort, of, same sort of story as I mentioned before. You know, fast forward today, and there's an awful lot of work ongoing around 
cloud and big data and analytics. And in a, a lot of these cases, IBM is helping to encourage that the, 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 uh, the benevolent dictators around these various projects actually bring them under open governance because we believe that's the best way of ensuring sustainability of some software. And if IBM is going to take on some project as like Cloud Foundry, as an example, as a critical component of our infrastructure, we want to make sure that it's, just, that it's not just going to get dropped on the floor sometime. Uh, we want to make sure that it's got some legs underneath it and it's going to be around for a while. And so we, we work with the pivotals of the world and the, red, uh, the, the rack spaces and so forth to ensure that, you know, let's, let's bring this under open governance. Let's get some friends and family in here and collaboratively develop this platform so that we all benefit from it. And we establish essentially a, a de facto standard around it. And we've been doing that <clears throat> for, for quite a while now. We like, to, we like to develop what I would consider to be, um, uh, you know, what I would consider to be the centers of gravity around key technologies, right? Build that ecosystem, that community around these technologies, establish skill sets around them, right? This is what makes a piece of software successful, is by doing this sort of center of gravity approach. And you know, the, the way that we go about, we, we, we have sort of a, an approach to how we engage with, with open source. Now, um, in many cases, we're coming in from the outside. And so initially, we're sort of helping out by writing code, fixing bugs, helping improve the documentation, doing translation, helping to build the community, helping to market the, the thing. We're not necessarily trying to take over from an architectural perspective, but we want to make sure that we start helping out in ways that benefit the community and help to, uh, to create those communities. And so we do an awful lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, the, the unfortunate, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, every year they have the Octoverse report comes out and says, oh, Microsoft is number one in open source. Well, okay, I got news for you. No, they're not. Um, it's actually Google or Red Hat, depending on how you want to measure things. And IBM is like three or four, right? Microsoft is further back in the pack in terms of contribution, in terms of writing code, they're, they're, they're back there. Uh, the problem that IBM has is we're doing so much of it, it's a little bit diluted. And so you don't see it. We're sort of like that invisible you know, layer of, st we're helping get stuff done behind the scenes. But we also do an awful lot where we're, instead of publishing something as open source and putting it under the IBM GitHub, we actively initially send it and we contribute it to Eclipse, like we did with OpenJ9 recently, or to Apache, as we did with SystemML and Tori, right? Or to the Linux Foundation, as we did with Hyperledger Fabric, um, the, uh, the blockchain platform that I'm actually working on um, presently. Uh, Xerces, remember Xerces? Again, the XML heritage of Jax. Xerces was an IBM contribution into Apache that provided XML parsing. It's in almost every XML parser. You probably don't even know that. But it was that important back in the day. It's probably still critically important. Um, but IBM, we didn't have, it wasn't IBM Xerces, it was Apache Xerces. We said, we need to make sure that this is open, put under open governance. We're going to contribute like heck to it, as we're doing with Hyperledger Fabric. But we welcome people to come and join in the fun. Um, uh, recently, a project called Quizkit. Quizkit is our quantum computing SDK. Put that out there as open source. Now, we didn't contribute that anywhere yet. That's under the IBM uh, brand, if you will. Open Power, another example. But my, my point with this chart is to sort of show you that while we don't have a VS code under the IBM GitHub, that doesn't mean that IBM isn't doing really significant work from an open source perspective. It's just that we actually actively work to make sure that we don't make it about IBM J9. We want it to be open. We want it to be Eclipse Open J9, right? Because that's the, the, the cultiv you know, cultivating that, that open governance is important to us. 
We also feel very strongly that, you know, there, there's three different approaches to how you can deal with open source. You can have open source where you just go down, you go to GitHub, you download it, and as they say, some assembly required and batteries not included, All right? This is, this is what you get if you, it's just plain old open source, it's your responsibility, you have to install it, develop it, maintain it, and so forth. Uh, then there's uh, the type that basically puts some sort of proprietary wrapper around it and hides the fact that there's any open source in there at all and doesn't allow you access to the APIs and so forth for the open source. Um, and that assures vendor lock-in, right? It's using open source, that's great, but it's assuring vendor lock, and that's the thing that most people want to avoid when they pick up and start using open source in their enterprise. And then there's the partner aspect where, like with Red Hat, as with IBM, where we focus on, yes, we're incorporating this open technology, but we do so in a way that preserves the access to all those APIs that ensures that as we continue to evolve Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes or Hyperledger Fabric, that you have, exclusive, you have access to all of those APIs. We aren't hiding them, we're not adding in secret sauce that makes it work. It's all open and anybody can create a business. So, you know, most recently, again, I've been working on Hyperledger Fabric, that's my sort of, my day job for the, for the, from an open source perspective these days. And, you know, so we have an offering around Hyperledger Fabric, we call it the IBM Blockchain Platform, and then all of a sudden Oracle came up, and they have the same, pretty much a very similar offering. And all my executives are like, what the heck did you just do? You, you enabled a competitor, and I said, that was the whole plan. <laughs> we want to create that ecosystem, we want it to be multi-vendor, right? So this is a good thing, not a bad thing. So I've written a paper with my colleague Todd Moore. Um, if you click on this link or if you look at that link there, and I'll share the slides after and we can post them someplace, I guess, Sebastian, right? Um, and you can also Google this. If you type in IBM approach to open technology and hit I'm feeling lucky on Google, you'll get this paper. And this basically gives the, the longer version of, of my talk. It talks about our approach, some of the things that we've done. Uh, we've got an awful lot of good content on IBM's GitHub organization. Unfortunately, IBM is also a little bit passive aggressive and every brand, and every division in IBM has their own GitHub org. And so IBM is scattered all over the place. We actually do have a, a link there, the ibmgithub.io, and you can actually find all of the the repositories, about 12, 12 1,300 of them. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to forget to mention uh, developer.ibm.com. That's, we have a, a booth in the, in the corner back there um, with our developer advocates. And we've been sort of working on this approach to integrate into our developer advocacy an aspect of open source into all of that. In fact, all of the content that we develop for our developer advocacy program is all open source as well. So I would encourage you to visit uh, with Nicholas and Thomas and, and the others uh, at the IBM booth. And that's my talk and I'm sticking to it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I deeply believe that this, uh, this idea of open source governance uh, in open source really matters. Yeah. Uh, and let me also add, there is also a, um, a discussion about ethics in, in, yeah. in, in open source at the moment. Uh, yeah. uh, Linus Torvalds uh, excused, yeah. <laughs> and I've read an interesting article uh. that a data scientist uh, studied, uh, made a study and, and investigated or and analyzed, I think, about 20,000 emails by mm -hmm. Linus, yeah. yeah. And I th they found uh, in 1,000 of them, the words bitch, crap, slut, <laughs> yeah, bastard, things like So this is not really an no, environment you no, really want not. to work in. It, it isn't, it isn't exactly. And so actually it was, uh, uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh, I think many, many projects in open source are now undergoing uh, sort of a, uh, you know, a, a revelation that, well, we need to work on this. We need to have a code of conduct for the projects that we maintain and some process for, for managing that. So absolutely, it's, it's something. But again, it's where these communities can sort of then recognize, yeah, we've got to fix this problem collectively together. Uh, it's a little bit different if it's just an individual you can maybe name and shame, but, you, you know, 
it's not necessarily that you're going to get a, a, a different result. So, absolutely, it's, it's an important aspect. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Enjoy the morning and see you later at the next keynote. Thank you.